Good afternoon. I'm Rich Lyons, the dean of your business school here at Berkeley Haas, and this is our Dean Speaker Series with our wonderful friend and colleague, uh, David Ocker. It is uh, part of our David Ocker Distinguished Lecture Series in Marketing. Uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, David, and also this is uh, co-sponsored with our MBA Haas Marketing Club, as well as with our Undergraduate Marketing Association. I know we've got a lot of those students in the room uh, here today, so thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, most of you know quite a lot about Dave. Uh, he's really an important part of the history of, of this school, of Ber Berkeley Haas. He, if, if you look more on, on the academic side of things, he has a, over 100 articles that he's published in the field of uh, marketing, broadly defined, including strategy. 16 books. Uh, seven of those 16 books are on brand strategy, which is, of course, his, uh, his, his signature area. Uh, his books have sell, sold uh, over a million copies around the world, translated into uh, many languages, some, some 20 languages today. He is uh, arguably the, the best known and most influential marketing strategist on the planet, bar, bar none. He is the author of the Auker brand identity model. Uh, it is a model, I went back into my own notes, it is a model that we used here. So when Tom Campbell, if you recall, became the director of finance, served the state of California in 2004 and 5, uh, I was his acting dean, and the first person I turned to was, uh, was Dave Auker. And we were thinking about a, some branding notes and a brand model. And I went back into my notes, so you're not going to be able to see this. But uh, this is the Auker brand identity model as applied to the Haas School and some of the ideas that went into this, the, the brand essence, the, uh, the core identity, the extended identity. Um, in fact, one of the elements of the extended identity was something, we used the term authentic, that we described as independent-minded, open thinking, and the third, uh, the third descriptor there was confidence without attitude, which uh, in a later permutation of our strategy became one of our, one of our defining principles. So uh, he pushed on us to think about what our identity was, where it came from, how it would differentiate us. Most importantly, I think, how we deliver on it, right? He never lost sight of that. And and he helped us to think about that. In his notes that I'm referring back to, this was an email that he sent me back in 2005 with a bunch of notes on how to sharpen the identity of the school. In those notes, one of the things he says is, look, we need to be honest. The brand of, of Berkeley, the reputation of Berkeley is sharper and better known around the world than the brand of Haas. At the time, our alumni magazine was called Cal Business. Well, Cal Business, I'm an undergraduate here. That's, that's heartstring stuff for anybody who's an undergrad. But boy, you know, Cal is an athletics brand. It is a local brand. Say Cal in Shanghai or Sao Paulo. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Say Berkeley in those places. Everybody knows what you're talking about. And it wasn't long after Dave sent me that email that we changed the name of our alumni magazine. It is, of course, now Berkeley Haas. It is no longer Cal Business. Uh, this, this identity starts with Berkeley, and those are some of the ideas among many, many that Dave has helped us with as a school. He continues to be tremendously prolific. His newest book, I mentioned there were uh, some 16, his newest one, Auker on Branding, 20 Principles that Drive Success, which in many ways is a, um, a compendium of his thinking over, over these, many, these many decades. Um, he's, look, he's been with us for a long, long time. So many of his students have done wonderful things, uh, profit brand strategies. He still serves as vice chairman of profit, and the founders uh, uh, still today say, say that they owe, they owe a lot of the seeds of that effort to him. Um, look, let, let me, let, without further ado, let's all welcome our friend Dave Ocker. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Rich. Well, it's, I'm pleased to be here, and I'm especially pleased to have any association with Rich Lyons. He's the best dean in the world, and we're so lucky to have him. It, you can just feel the energy as you walk into this place. Um, about a year and a half ago, I, I sort of took, uh, tried to take stock, kind of reflected. I had written actually five branding books, some related books, a dozen articles on branding, and I blog at davidocker.com every week, and I had almost 200 of those, and I sort of sat back and said, what's, what's important? Really, what really u works? What's useful? And um, as a result of that, I organized these uh, you know, three dozen uh, ideas or four dozen into these 20 principles, and that resulted in this book. Um, 
a couple, I told Rich that whatever you do in the introduction, be sure to mention the book is, can be now ordered. It'll be delivered in, in June. And there's a special promotion at 800 CEO Read. And um, uh, that if you order 25 books, you get it at a special price. He, he failed to do that. I also, I also noted that the, the, one of the big selling points is on the back, there's some endorsement of some really prestige people, one of which is Rich Lyons, who said it's, it's outstanding. So, um, um, so today what I'm going to do is to pull out uh, the six biggest ideas from that, that uh, set. And, uh, and then at the end I might talk about the second six. If, uh, but anyway, the first of the, of the six is the fact that brand is an asset. Brand is an asset. That, that's just huge. I mean, it's really changed marketing. Uh, take you back to May of 1931. A guy named Neil McElroy wrote a three-page memo. He was a, worked in advertising for Keme Soap at Procter & Gamble was under the shadow of ivory, and he got kind of frustrated. He wrote a three-page memo, and he talked about a brand man, sort of a new function in business, a brand man. And uh, actually, just writing a three-page memo was, was exceptional because the CEO had a firm rule. All memos had to be one page or less. So that, there's an organizational behavior lesson somewhere there. Um, that, that Neil McElroy went on to become the CEO of, of uh, Procter & Gamble, led them from bar soap to an tr incredible diversified company. He later became Secretary of Defense under Eisenhower, went through I th one of the only administrations in the last century for which there was no war. That was Neil McElroy. But probably the, mo the most influential thing he ever did was that three-page memo, because that started brand management that was, became the accepted way you do marketing around the world for, for well, since then. And, um, but the, the guiding principle of it, it was all about tactics. How you marshal advertising, promotion, distribution, and package them all together in a, in a, in a, in a process. And how you use everything to drive sales. That was the dependent variable sales. Well, fast forward about 55 years. I'm sitting in August of 1988 in Austin, Texas, in a conference entitled Brand Equity, Definition, Measurement, and Management. And I think the people in that meeting knew that something big was happening because um, there was growing acceptance for a lot of reasons that uh, uh, of the idea that Brand is an asset. It has equity. It drives strategy going forward and performance. It was a huge idea. It completely changed marketing. It changed who did marketing. It changed what marketing did. And it changed why marketing was, what the objective was. It was, it was really extraordinary. Um, so under the brand management system developed by McElroy, 1931, that it was a, a middle management or lower management tactical kind of thing. That was the brand manager. And now the brand manager is a CMO. He has a seat at the table, along with the CEO and the CIO and the CFO and the COO. Marketing's got a seat at the table now. He's dealing with, uh, with strategy. And what marketing does is now completely different. It's now involved in strategy, in addition to tactics. It's not just tactical. So uh, you look at customer insights. It's, it's no longer, you know, what's the best ad or what's the best promotion. It's now, you know, what's the next growth platform? So you have Procter & Gamble with uh, uh, the new iPods and uh, Downey single rents. They create whole new growth platforms. It's really strategic. And segmentation, you have McDonald's looking at, uh, at, at uh, not only families, but looking at breakfast uh, time parts, at looking at, at older people, and so forth, and looking at uh, people that are health conscious. Segmentation is driving strategy. It's not just tactics. 
And uh, the value proposition, Hyundai, you know, an incredible brand story. And they realized that uh, styling and quality was really something that had to be in their value proposition. It was a very strategic decision. And, you know, I mean, look at General Electric. Uh, when Emolt came and said, we got to grow internally by, by innovation. And he charged every business to create three imagination breakthroughs that will generate $100 million or more in three to five years. And that whole initiative was run by the marketing group. Beth Comstock, the CMO, ran that. Marketing did it. Uh, and it was a natural place for that to be. And it, it also changed why marketing. It used to be marketing is engaged in, in stimulating sales. And that, in the, in the early and mid-80s when scanner data came in, that really accelerated these, these disastrous decisions to devote marketing into promotions because that would drive sales. They destroyed brands. And the brand craft took three years to, to resurrect itself. It, it got almost destroyed. And, uh, but, so the emphasis now is not only on sales, but on, on brand equity. On uh, things like perceptions, like perceived quality, and, and other dimensions of differentiation. In uh, relevance, which is visibility and credibility. You know, are you the brand that, that's going to be considered for this job? And loyalty, things like uh, the ability of a brand to generate an audience that will refer the brand to others. And so those kind of measures, which are tied to long-term success, not immediate success. Well, at the risk of, of being uh, a little over the top, I'll be a little over the top. You know, if you look at the last century, uh, uh, the big marketing ideas that have changed business, you had mass marketing, you had marketing concept, market segmentation, and I think you have to add, you know, brand equity. Brands are assets. It's really fundamentally changed the way business looks at itself and the way it's managed. Um, second is the brand vision. So just a, a personal note, um, how many are golfers in here? So you'll know, uh, maybe you don't know the statistic, but I'll tell you the statistic. One half of all golfers are stick to the rules. I mean, they're really sticklers. They won't do anything that's not, uh, get, they, they bring rules book with them. That's half the golfers. The other half play golf for fun. And some of the latter group, once in a while, have what we call do-overs. That means you, you do it over. And... Uh, I mean, they're not without principles, you know. You only do over if there was a no, or somebody was talking when you're shooting, or you inadvertently poked out the wrong club. So there has to be a reason for it, but, but there's in any event do-overs. And um, so anyway, I need a do-over. And uh, I have changed the name of the brand identity model to the brand vision model. I, I, the brand identity model was developed in building strong brands and elaborated in brand leadership, but um, brand vision is more forward-looking. It's got more energy, and it's not tied by anybody to some concept and design as brand identity is. So anyway, the, the model is exactly the same. There's no change, but uh, it's now called brand vision. And here is the brand vision uh, uh, for the Haw School, Berkeley Haw School of Business that was developed uh, really by Rich. And, and let me make uh, a few observations about this model as it's described here. First of all, it, um, it, it's not a three-word phrase. You know, so many people think that you've got to crystallize a brand into a three-word phrase. But it's my view that brands, even simple packaged goods brands, are more than that. And that if you restrict them to a three-word phrase, you lose a lot. And, um, and so we have four what we call core vision elements. And notice that even those ha are elaborated to give you the Berkeley Hall spin on that concept. 
So even those don't rely on a three-word phrase. We elaborate them. Uh, the second thing is that it's not a fill-in-the-box model. A lot of brand management models will look something like this. They'll say that uh, a brand has eight components and you've got to fill in the box for each of them. And if you brand wants, is, is, is aspirationally should stand for something that doesn't have a box, then it's, you're, you're, you're screwed, right? It's not going to happen. And on the other hand, if you've got a, a box in here like relationship or personality that doesn't apply to your brand and your context, it doesn't matter. You've got to figure out something. You've got to write something in there. So the brand vision model is not like that. The brand vision model asks, what do you want your brand to stand for? And anything can be on the table, and nothing has to be on the table. And um, I think that's really powerful. A, a, a third thing is that these brand divisions evolved. I mean, we can go back to that 2005 uh, thing, and we usually have an extended version, which these are uh, additional dimensions that aren't as important as the core. But as, as Rich pointed out, confidence without attitude was not a core vision element. It was, it was an extended element, and it got promoted as, as we evolved it. And uh, you can look at Rich's brand vision year by year, and you can see its evolution and its change. And uh, sometimes it changed because he made it better, and sometimes it changed because something changed in the system. And he changed his vision a little bit. So this is a dynamic thing. It can evolve. Fourth, it, it affects everything. This is just a wonderful example of a brand vision that means something. Because driven by this brand vision, or explicated by the brand vision, it's uh, affected everything in this school. The faculty we recruit, um, the uh, research centers, how the research centers are communicated, uh, how we relate to our alumni. And they've, if, if even now got the, the, the admissions program to align with the vision. So we're admitting people that buy into the vision. And uh, it's really changed the whole student body. Um, and um, notice an, another thing about it. It's, it. It does, not all brand visions have a personality, uh, aspirational personality. But when you do, you often get a lot of differentiation. You get a lot of energy. And the Haas one does. It's got confidence without attitude. And that's turned out to be really differentiating. I mean, there is a, a set of very prestige schools I could name off the top of my head that would kill to have a little less attitude. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we, we have a, um, a personality element. Another uh, uh, dimension I'll call your attention to is beyond yourself. It's a higher purpose. And I'm really, and, and that does a lot of things for you. Longer view of decision, behave ethically, higher purpose. It is amazing how many companies have, have really created a higher purpose. And I'm not talking about Patagonia here. I'm talking about Walmart. I'm talking about Coca-Cola. It's really extraordinary. And... Um, uh, it turns out that these companies with a higher purpose make more money. Now, nobody's conclusively showed that that's why they make more money, but they do make more money. If you look at the book by Jim Stengel called Grow, the former CMO of P&G, or if you look by the book by the Emory people called uh, Firms of Endearment, or if you look at any one of a hundred studies on sustainability, you find that Companies with a higher purpose end up making more money. Um, it's like that old story about the fellow that was walking along, 
passed a construction site and saw some bricklayers. And he asked the first bricklayer, what do you do? And he said, I make a living. And he asked the second the bricklayer, what do you do? And he said, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm the best bricklayer in town. And I strive to get the best set of, uh, best wall possible from these bricks. And he asked the third bricklayer, what do you do? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. And uh, there's, there's something to be said about being inspiring. I mean, the plain flat re- uh, reality is that Milton's Friedman's, you know, admission that the business of business is to make profits is not winning. It's not winning. Uh, and it's not winning for a lot of reasons. And it's, it's complicated. But, uh, but having a higher purpose is worth considering. That doesn't mean every brand needs to have a higher purpose. But it does mean that uh, and every brand doesn't need to have a personality, but those two things ought to be on the table to at least consider. Subcategory competition. Um, this was the subject of my book, Brand Relevance, Making Competitors Irrelevant. Um, I really think in, in the future, brand competition is going to be uh, at the margin, less and less important, and subcategory competition is going to be more and more important. You're going to have to worry about the, the category that uh, you're in and how it's defined and how that category is doing against other sub- subcategories rather than just, you know, promoting your brand. Um, it, it, this, I, I got the idea originally about six, seven years ago when I, I did a lot of work in Japan and I had access to Japan beer data. And I looked at 40 years of beer data and noticed that only four times did the market share trajectory change. Despite the fact there was enormous advertising and new product vitality every single year. I mean, these guys have put out four new products a year. Um, and three of the times that that change happened, there was a new subcategory formed. In 1986, uh, Super Dry came out. In 1990, Ichiban came out from Karen. And uh, in 2000, the Hapashu category got traction because of Karen's leadership. The fourth time, two categories, subcategories, were simultaneously repositioned. Lager beer and super dry were both simultaneously repositioned in 1996. That changed the trajectory. Four times, 40 years, there was any meaningful change. I mean, it's all about growth, right? Everybody, through 70, the 25 years from 1970 on, everybody was trying to grow. That was the objective of their business. Didn't happen. Nothing, nothing. Um, and I, can, I went in the car industry. I went in the water industry. I went in, in uh, the banking industry. It's the same story. Every time you see a computer industry, any time you see a spurt of growth and you look at it carefully, it's not because somebody did better marketing or advertising or pricing. It was because there was a new subcategory form. So there's two routes to winning. One is... Uh, I'll call it, my brand is better than your brand marketing. It's brand preference competition. And it's based upon uh, incremental innovation. You always try each year to make your offering a little bit better than before. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's based on all kind of brand preference marketing. And the problem is that it... Uh, it doesn't create growth. It almost well, there's some exceptions, but with rare exceptions, it doesn't create growth. And it's so not fun. And uh, and it and it leads to often, you know, margin erosion. And then there's the other way to compete: create managed subcategories where my brand is relevant. So now, instead of the subcategory being fixed and assumed. 
it's in play. Subcategory is dynamic now. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the innovation is different. The innovation, instead of being incremental, is now substantial or even transformational. It's big innovation because it has to create what I call must-haves. Something that the marketplace must have. And if a competitor doesn't have a must-have, he's not considered, he's not relevant. So winning is completely different. Winning is when your, your competitor is not even considered. It's not that he's not preferred, he's not even considered. He's irrelevant. So let me take some examples. You know, Marriott did some research, and as a result of that research on how businessmen used the hotel lobbies and rooms, they changed it. Make it a lot easier for two people to converse. Made it more computer friendly. Uh, really changed the atmosphere. And, uh, and that, for a lot of travelers, became must-haves. Um, Siebel 7 created CMR when, uh, uh, no, CRM, CRM. And I hate three letters. Uh, people that, that call their brand something by three letters, well, four letters is worse, but three letters is, is really bad. And, um, but anyway, customer relationship management is CRM. Um, so you notice when, when I make a mistake, I blame it on the, the branding. It the, uh, wasn't my fault. Um, but what they did was they packaged all these software programs that related to a customer interaction into one system. And so the marketplace, a lot of the marketplace, started to buy systems instead of these components. So it no longer mattered if you made the best component in the world because they weren't buying that anymore. They weren't buying what you're making. They're buying something else. Um, you know, the energy bar was started by a, a, a real friend of the Berkeley Hall School, uh, the power bar in 1981 or so. And that was, I don't know if anybody's eaten a power bar, but it is really, it is really masculine. I mean, it is chewy and it's, uh, got all the stuff that somebody needs when he's in the middle of a marathon. Um, so Luna came out with a brand for women. It was completely different. It had different components in it. Duh. Right? Different taste, different texture, different positioning. And uh, so they created a whole new subcategory. Energy bars for women. You can augment the, uh, the uh, offerings. So Best Buy observed that people were frustrated with having to install and maintain and service entertainment systems and computer systems. So they bought this little operation called the Geek Squad. They've now grown it to 20,000 people or something. And that, for a lot of people, is a, a must-have. They don't want any more to go to a store where they get a computer entertainment system that they can't make work. Um, and then there's, you could just change the whole subcategory, change the motivation. So Procter & Gamble was stuck in China because Chinese customers weren't interested in dryness or convenience. They just weren't. It wasn't a reason for them to change their habits. So um, what they did is observe that one of the things that, that uh, they are interested in is, is their ability of their of their baby to sleep in a healthy way because they, they instinctively knew that was going to affect their future ability to, you know, to learn. And uh, Proctor, uh, you know, uh, prescribed a, or got a study done by the Beijing Children's Hospital Sleep Research Unit or something. And they found that if a baby wore pampers, he'd go to sleep faster, he would sleep 30 minutes more, and you'd have 50% less disruptions. So they came out with a, a sleep whatever program that effectively repositioned the whole subcategory. And, uh, and then as part of that, they had all the mothers send in pictures of sleeping babies. Can you imagine anything better than that? 
And they created a collage of, a, of 100,000 of those pictures in a huge thing in Shanghai that won the Guinness Book of Records for the largest collage ever. And um, in 19, no, 2011, or 2006, they, there was almost no disposable diapers sold. It was, it was such a tiny market, didn't matter. Three billion of them were sold in 2011, and Pampers was the leading brand, the exemplar of the whole category. So they really, you know, managed that subcategory. And that's a way to grow. So branded differentiators. You know, the, the, every brand has to differentiate some way, right? So here's what happens. You, you know you have to differentiate so, and you're really smart and good, so you innovate. You get an innovation that differentiates. And, and what happens to competitors? Copy it. Or even worse, they, they pretend or appear to copy it. So you no longer have a, a you know, point of view of, of, you're no longer differentiated. So what can you do? Well, you can brand it. And then you generate a branded differentiator. There was a uh, colleague of Rich and mine here, Rashi Glazier, that did a study in which he showed some people a, an outer garment and the other an outer garment with a Alpine class fill in it, a, a branded differentiator. And people that saw that one were more willing to pay more. They thought it was worth more than, than the other one. So the, even though they had no idea what this was, remember Intel Inside? Nobody knew what Intel Inside would. They pay 10% more for the computer at one point in time. So we know that it works. Um, you look at the heavenly bed. Um, you know, better bed, more pillows, a comforter, blankets, tea to the, the climate, and so on. You put that in a hotel, occupancy goes up. Perceptions of styling go up. Uh, customer satisfaction goes up. It's, it's amazing. And all the hotels are trying to copy the heavenly bed, but, you know, Weston has branded it. There's only one heavenly bed. Uh, look at Harley Davidson that's branded the, the photo center in, uh, in the ride planner. Um, and so that's a service that, you know, people can uh, uh, will associate with Harley because they own it. And it, what it means is that this is a brand that's really involved in something that you really, uh, really like. You look at the, uh, the, the Hawes Berkeley School of Business. Uh, the Lester Center is a branded differentiator. Now, Berkeley can say that it's uh, going to challenge the status quo, but there's, there, you can't find a business school in the country that's not got innovation as one of its core things. So we need a, a spin on it, we need credibility, and nobody else has the Lester Center. And the Lester Center has the Berkeley Entrepreneurs Forum. It's its branded differentiator. So the, you see the implications. If you understand the Berkeley Entrepreneurs Forum is a differentiator for Lester, which is a differentiator for Berkeley, that casts a different light on the uh, entrepreneur's form for Rich and the power structure at Hawes, Berkeley Hawes. Um, it, it, it says that it has a role beyond just its, its you know, role if you look at it as an autonomous unit. It sort of fits uh, the system of brands at Berkeley. And it goes the other way. I mean, Berkeley is a branded differentiator for Lester, and Lester is a branded differentiator for Berkeley Entrepreneurs Forum as well. Because uh, if Lester's Center for Entrepreneurship would be a standalone thing out in, in San Jose or something, it wouldn't have the power it does as being part of the Ber Haas Berkeley family. But that doesn't mean we can put a brand on everything. I mean, there's always the innovation champion that thinks that it's better than it is. So you have to ask some tough questions. Is it worth branding? Is it a significant advance? Do the customers really care? And will it merit investment over time? So this isn't a license to overbrand. Customer sweet spots. So this is what we want a brand to do. We want a brand to have visibility to stand out, that's one of the cornerstones of relevance. 
We wanted to have energy. Brands around the world are losing energy, and we, uh, uh, those that have it uh, have a big edge. We want it to be light. We wanted to have a relationship beyond transactions. And above all, everybody wants to be a social media player. Everybody wants to figure out digital. Uh, and it's, it's, really a, it's really pathetic, actually, how, uh, how, how people just want to so bad. Um, so what do they do? Well, they, they engage in marketing. And what do you, what's your objective in marketing? Well, it's to, uh, it's to sell people on the offering and maybe the firm. It's to uh, tell people about attributes and benefits so they will like and buy and be loyal to the offering and the brand. That's what we do. That's kind of what's natural. So is that going to, uh, you know, take a brand like Avon. They make uh, skin care, they make jewelry, they make fragrances. It, it is, if talking about those things, is that going to help them gain visibility, energy, be liked? A, a, a relationship beyond transactions or social media? Get, are people going to go into social media and talk about the Avon skincare item? I don't think so. I mean, it's just not that interesting to them. They don't care. But what about uh, if you developed a, uh, looked at a consumer sweet spot instead of looking at your brand and your offering? And you find a shared interest where you can be an active and interesting partner in the customer sweet spot. What then? So let's look at the uh, Avon Walk for Breast Cancer, for example. So we've got, uh, it's been in effect over 20 year, years. Um, and uh, it's uh, raised $640 million for charity. Every year they have eight or nine runs in the U.S., and in, in these runs are thousands of women, and some running in teams. And, uh, and there's many, many uh, tens of thousands that are supporting them, and, and millions that are aware and in some way thinking about such events. Um, and, and just think about, uh, let's see, I'm going backwards. Anyway, let's just think about uh, how that program does. I mean, it creates energy for the brand. It uh, creates visibility for the brand that you couldn't possibly do to end up about skincare items. And it not only makes the brand more light, it creates a relationship with the brand. And even better, it, it stimulates social media activity. I mean, you go to the web to learn about the next race. You go about to find a teammate or to uh, share pictures. And so you're engaged in social media around the Avon brand. And the Avon brand has this higher purpose to be involved in women and women's uh, you know, issues. Look at uh, Pampers. I mean, people really aren't interested in diapers. I mean, they're just not. Um, and, uh, but they are interested in baby care. So Pampers has a go-to site that talks about you know, pregnancy, new baby, uh, uh, the toddler, preschooler, me, my family, and so on. And if you look at uh, the, uh, the baby section, there's something like, uh, I don't know, 60 white papers, there's 240 forms, there's 21 play and learn activities. So it, and it's a, in a way to connect with people. So again, if you think about those things that we want brands to do, including being active in social media, I mean, this hits a home run, doesn't it? But the key is to look for the customer's sweet spot, become a shared interest partner, instead of the normal goal is to promote our offering and our brand and our firm. So it's, a, it's really a different... Uh, way and and if instead of developing your own program, you could partner with somebody like uh, Home Depot does with Habitat for Humanity. They provide materials, they provide people, they provide signage in their stores, and so they're connecting with a, a customer sweet spot 
with, uh, without development on their own. They didn't develop habitat for humanity. They are just connecting to it. Final one, silo coordination. Silos are really uh, a, a tough problem because they, uh, you know, I'm talking about product silos, company silos, or, and functional silos. Um, but they, they, uh, what they mean is silo spanning offerings and programs are inhibited. And these days you've got to scale. And if you can't scale, you're really at a huge disadvantage. And silos prevent that. They lead to brand confusion. If you look at Toshiba, which is on 100 different businesses in, in 100 countries, I mean, it's, it's all over the place. And there's no control over the Toshiba brand. Uh, and good ideas are not leveraged. So if a good idea appears in, in some country, there's almost no mechanism to get it into, uh, into another. And there's resource misallocation. Uh, and so what happens is the big countries, the big businesses, the big products, they get, uh, they get the resources. And uh, the ones that have potential for the future don't. Because that's the sort of the, uh, the, the decentralized way that resource allocation is done. So what do you do? One, you can come in and make a dramatic change. Like, uh, there was a time in which IBM was, was on the verge of, of disappearing. They were going to break it up into seven separate companies. These silos were completely out of control. And so Lou Gerstner came in, who was one of the great CEOs of our time, and uh, he did some c customer research. He called it Operation Bear Hug. He talked to a whole bunch of customers. He and his, his direct reports and their direct reports. And what the customers clearly told them is, we want IBM that, that, that is, takes responsibility and gives a solution to the whole problem. We don't want to buy components. And so he, uh, he made IBM uh, you know, a system solution company around the IBM brand. He uh, changed the budget behind the IBM brand from 10% of the then around almost a billion dollar budget to 50%. Can you imagine the pain? Um, and he, cre he changed from 70 agencies to one. He sent a memo to the, uh, to his sta to the employees and about some, some element of that. And the head of IBM Europe didn't think it was appropriate for his people, so he held it back. Two weeks later, he was out of a job. Um, this is really an abrupt change. But unless you have a crisis situation, unless you have a CEO like Lou Gerstner, it usually is not feasible to do this. What is feasible is to do some uh, non-threatening roles to generate change. And this came out of a, of a study I did that was reported in the book called Spanning Silos, which I talked to 50 CMOs and asked them, what are the silo problems and what have you done about them that worked? And the, the short answer is that anything you can do to replace competition and isolation with cooperation and, uh, and, and, uh, and communication is going to create real change and is going to alleviate the problem. So you can have the central marketing group look as a facilitator. Like Nestle does, they have a, a, you know, a learning center around topics like Hispanic, mom and kids, and Walmart. So it's a place for people to come together with a common interest because a lot of different brands in Nestle's family are, are worried about the Hispanic market. You can be a service replier. So at BP, the marketing group did some segmentation studies and they were so effective and so persuasive that the other business units were lining up to have them do the segmentation study for them. And you could be a strategic partner or consultant. So the central group at Frito-Lay works with the individual brands to give them insight and, and a broader perspective to help them develop effective brand strategies. 
So notice something, that all these things that, that uh, are done into these uh, non-threatening roles get the central group and the CMO into strategy. Because understanding the Hispanic market leads to the potential of making some strategic choices with new strategic options. Segmentation is by its nature strategic. I mean, what product market is going to be the future? And developing brand strategy is, is really the essence of, of brand strategy and creating the right brand vision and operationalizing it. So those are uh, six big ideas. The fact that brand is an asset, brand vision, subcategory competition, branded differentiators, the customer sweet spot, connecting to that by being a partner, and silo coordination. So if I had to do six more, I would uh, put brand energy. You know, the brands with energy have a huge advantage. The stories, that's the hot topic of the day in marketing now is stories. And I talk about not only stories, but signature stories, stories that represent your brand and how to create and, and manage them. The high, higher purpose is, is really a big idea. Digital strategies, I mean, I can't tell you how, how, how badly people want to get that right. Um, internal branding, because that drives everything about the brand. And brand portfolio strategies because we almost all manage portfolios of brands and you've got to make them synergistic, you've got to make them have clarity, you've got to make them uh, uh, you know, have energy. And so brand portfolio strategy can be really a big difference. Thank you so much for having me again. And And we have some time for some questions. Please use the microphones. These are caught on video, and in fact, these are some of our most, most watched videos, are these Dave Ocker yeah, lectures. Yeah, they fast forward to they, the question and answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can I take the first question? Is that okay? Because yeah. I have a microphone. Yes, so I'm yes, breaking yes. my own uh, rule. I, any uh, time I can interact with you, it's, thank you I always Dave. learn something. Thank you. Internal branding. Could yeah. you just say a couple more words? Is that sort of, your, your people need to deeply understand the brand. But how do we understand Yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, a process. You have to, uh, you know about it. You have to then, so you have to get people to know about it. That's kind of the easy part, right? You just, you just send Rich out a couple times, this charismatic guy. But then you gotta get them to believe in it. So you gotta have some programs that deliver. So when they say you're gonna challenge the status quo, well now there's an entrepreneurial center and there's B and C and D. So that gives credibility that you're really going to do. I remember we had a friend, I won't mention his name, that was a, a dean of another competing business school whose deal was globalization. And he would give these magnificent speeches about globalization. Does that ring a bell? Anyway, nothing. The, the faculty was, there was not one faculty hired that was remotely interested in globalization. There were no courses on globalization. There was no research on globalization. But he was out there talking about globalization. But you got, so you got to make them believe. And then you got to make them live it. So it's no believe and live. And so that means that they have to really do things differently. And, uh, and all those things. And then you have to, of course, segment the internal thing. And, and uh, so you got the researchers, uh, you got the research centers, you've got the admissions, you've got the uh, uh, placement people, and of course you got the faculty. If it wasn't for the faculty, it would be a piece of cake, right? <laughs> um, so you've got, and all those will, will have to be uh, treated differently along that path. Thanks. Other questions, please. Hi, thank you for this. So I'm wondering, most of the examples that you shared are from big and well-established companies. I'm wondering how do you see those principles apply to small and growing business, and if you have any interesting examples of startups disrupting the market using those principles. Thank you. Um, no, I think the principles are identical. I don't think there's, there's a separate 
principles. I mean, I don't think there's a separate set of principles. Now, usually in, in, uh, when you're dealing with startups, whether it's a big company or a small company, you, you have some, some basic issues. Of some, you have to get traction in some way. And that requires certain tactics, and the social media world that we live in is relevant to that. Um, so that, that might be uh, uh, one thing. But the principle is the same. You've got to have um, something that makes you stand out, that some, hopefully a branded differentiator, or, or in some way to own a uh, position that can really attract a, a niche. You know, I have a friend that has an organic s snack company, and uh, uh, they've been able to capture you know, the organic seaweed area, and, and there's not a lot of people that can compete with them because they don't have the access to the supply that they do. And so uh, that gives them an edge. But it, it, the principles are the same, I would say. Um, I have a question about the customer Swiss bar. Mm -hmm. So can we understand in the other way that to create engagement with customers and motivate them to um, move the goals uh, as, a, as a brand, right, and just, just simply motivate them to purchase your products? Is, is that the right interpretation of customer Swiss bar? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but with, with Sweet Spot, I, what I mean is, you look at what are the customer's activities, what do they do? You look at what are they interested in, what are their opinions, and, and that's because that's where they spend their time, that's what they talk about. And so you want to get something that will, that will allow you to share that interest and be, and be some a way a partner. And uh, uh, so it's a completely different way of looking at your customer. Instead of looking at how can we make this customer you know, buy skincare items, and uh, how can we, you know, differentiate, make it appealing? Our brand's better than your brand. Instead of that, we just say, "What? What are you interested in?" And so, in the case of Avon, it was, you know, breast cancer. I mean, these people are really concerned with breast cancer. Sephora has something, um, uh, a uh, a website that it's called Beauty Talk. And it's a, you know, that these people, a lot of their audience are really interested in beauty stuff. I mean, it uh, wouldn't interest Rich and I, but it's, uh, they've, they'll spend hours on the website talking to each other, talking to experts, looking about things. And it's not about Sephora products. I mean, Sephora products are there, and, and, and they, they play a small role, but the, it's mainly just how do you be more beautiful? Um, so, again, you, if you look at that audience, especially the young female audience, that's what they talk about. That's what they're interested in. They're not interested, per se, in Sephora products. Um, can you share a story about when you were a professor at Haas and maybe one of your favorite things about that experience? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget. I w we were in Barrows Hall at one time, which is the world's worst building. And I have an office, <laughs> I have an office next to Rich Lyons. And so I'm sitting there, you know, doing my research and trying to ignore students as best I can. And Rich is in there explaining to some student, giving them 20 minutes on, on some uh, some demand curve and uh, and I'm I'm beside myself and and so I'm, I'm I'm telling rich I said you know I could also win the best teaching award if I spent that kind of time with students yes <laughs> priorities all mixed up <laughs> When you think about the future of marketing, of the 20 big ideas that you wrote about, which one most excites you and why? Well, I'm, um, uh, I, I think this subcategory competition is just a huge idea. And uh, it, it's, uh, 
you know, I, it, I don't know, it hasn't gotten that much traction, but I think it's a huge idea. Um, so I guess that would be the one. I mean, Brandis and Asset, you know, changed business, changed marketing, but it's really, we, we kind of won that battle, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, over with. And the other three things are, are um, a, a little bit tactical as well as strategic. So I think subcategory competition is the one. I would say that what I'm, I'm really working on now is probably my best article would be, my next article would be on stories. And uh, that's gotten so much interest and I'm just gonna try to put on my take on it, which has to do with the strategic element of stories and their relationship to brands. So we have time for three more short questions, thanks. For being here, um, my question is about digital strategies and the role of big data. Everybody's talking about it, but uh, I'm kind of curious what your perspective is on, you know, how a CMO should use that and how you think about it going forward. Well, this is what I tell the analytic people. In 19 early 1980s, we had a, a sort of a big data revolution of its own. It was called scanner data. So the, the supermarkets could scan and all of a sudden you knew exactly what people were buying. And you could do these market experiments in which you knew exactly what happened. And what happened was, if you gave a price promotion, it would get a huge bump in sales, and if you did anything else, nothing, no sales bump. So everybody put their money into these promotions, and that's what I mentioned earlier, destroyed brands like Kraft. And so my worry about the analytic people is that you know, be careful about what independent variable you use. Because still in all, sales is really important. Now, we've got sophisticated models, and we've got sophisticated people. But we had some sophisticated models back then too. The problem is that the sophisticated model builders aren't capable of telling the people that really want to scientifically manage the marketing budget what the limitations are, and sometimes they're not motivated to because that would make them less valuable. So that's what I worry about with big data. I was in your last class that you taught at Haas, and so I feel very lucky to have snuck in under the wire. Thank you for that. Uh, my question is, when you are encouraging companies to go out and do, uh, have conversations to identify if they're creating a subcategory or just learning what, what they're seeking what are the top couple of questions you encourage people to ask to get the best information as that starting market research for then potentially creating a new brand to then differentiate and so forth? Well, I, um, I have in the Brand Relevance book, you know, 20 or 25 ways of generating ideas. And um, so a, a lot of people want ideas and, and there's just a lot of ways you can go about doing that. Um, uh, I think that... that uh, sort of one of the routes into, into that conversation is innovation. Because people instinctively know they not, they've got to be innovative. And they also instinctively know that, that uh, market-driven innovation has got to play a role in the whole innovation process. So that's often a starting point that will allow people to get involved. Thank you for your lecture today. My question is on subcategories. A lot, it seems that products are <clears throat> reaching to a point that everything's commoditized, everything, every, every, there's no sub-market or sub-segment that is not being touched. And companies are moving in towards getting an emotional benefit. Do you think that by doing that, you could create a subcategory, or actually companies need to still focus in on innovation and try to push that forward? No, you definitely can have a must-have, an emotional attachment of some kind. I mean, you take a Dove, for example, the uh, company that has, uh, you know, elevated the, uh, the, the self-confidence of women and the fact that you don't have to be slender or young to be beautiful. You can be beautiful at every age in different weights. And so, um, uh, I mean, I think that, that creates... A, uh, an emotional overlay, a, a, a social benefit that, is a, that provides a basis for relationship. And I think it's part of the reasons they've created a three or four billion dollar 
a business out of a $200 million bar soap. Um, so yeah, I, I think definitely um, emotional, self-expressive, social uh, benefits can, can make a difference. So all of you had at your seat this magazine on the cover, The Father of Corporate Identity. Who is that? That is Dave Ocker. And on the front page of this article, they describe him as the Plato and the Newton of bland- branding. I have not been described as the Plato or, or, Plato or the Newton of my field. Uh, he is both of his field. We are so proud to have David as part of our community and all that he's done for us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rich. Thanks.